Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tara Bono. I am the assistant director of programs and engagement oh, yeah, was it at the Avalon Public Library. We are thrilled tonight to welcome Carol Fitzgerald from the Book Reporter Network. <laughs> Book Report Network, I apologize. Her website is bookreport.com and she also does reading group guides. She is the um, host of the very popular Book Reporter Talks To, where she talks with authors on her podcast and the Book of Chino Live book group. All right, without further ado, we have Carol Fitzgerald. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kara. Let's see. I'll hold this one. Yep. Okay, so yes, use this, and yes, use the other one. Okay. This is many tasks, everybody. Many tasks. So let's see how this goes. First of all, it's great to be back here. I've been doing this event since 2017, and it's always one of my favorite events to do, so I am so happy to be back here once again. Got a lot of books, so let's get started. And we're going to kick it off with fiction, because we know that that's usually what everybody wants to read the most. I'm going to start now with a book called Yellow Face by R.F. Quang. And this book is a lot of fun for a couple of reasons. I'll read you the description, but besides that, it's a book about publishing. It's about the insider look at publishing. And it's also about when you're the best-selling author and somebody else is not. How does that person feel? How do you feel when you get back up on top and the other person's down? What is it really like inside publishing when you're doing well, when you're not doing well? And as all the insecurities securities that are, um, the authors face right here in one book. So we've also got a, some messaging going on here about what are we doing with people who are people of color? How do we handle their books? And this woman in this book, we'll start with, authors June Hayward and Athena Liu were supposed to be twin rising stars. They were supposed to both be the big hot people. But while Athena has become the literary darling, June is literally nobody. Like no one knows about her books. So when June witnesses Athena's death, I'll just tell you, it happens really early, folks. She chokes on a pancake, okay, at the beginning of the book. All of a sudden, uh, um, June acts on impulse and goes and takes her almost finished manuscript and takes it with her, and she leaves the house. And this book is an experimental novel about the unsung contributions of Chinese laborers during World War I. Would you feel that um, Athena would be allowed to write because she's someone who's Asian, and is June okay to be writing this book? Let's just see, because this is a lot of what's going on in publishing right now. So what if June edits that book and she sends it in as her own? And what if her new publisher decides to rebrand her as Juniper Song? And what if when they take a picture of her, they make her look kind of racially, we're not sure which race she is. And this is what's actually going on in publishing. So does this um, piece of history deserve to be told? Who's allowed to tell the story? But June can't get away from Athena's shadow because there's this thing called social media and people start to figure her out and come after her. And all of a sudden there's evidence threatening to bring her stolen success down all around her. Meanwhile, she's written a hit and everybody wants to know, when's your next book? Which is exactly what happens in publishing all the time. Okay. Next, we've got Little Monsters by Adrienne Bedour. Now, some of you may remember her last book, which was Wild Game. It was a memoir she wrote about, um, I believe that she was out hunting for people for her mother to date. So that was Wild Game that was out a couple of years ago. So now we've got Little Monsters. This is on sale tomorrow. Ken and Abby Gardner lost their mother when they were small. Their father, Adam, is a brilliant oceanographer who raised them mostly on his own. The son is now a successful businessman with political ambitions and a picture-perfect family. And Abby is a talented visual artist who depends on her brother's goodwill, in part because he owns the studio where she creates her art. So the novel opens, Adam is approaching his 70th birthday. He's always managed his bipolar disorder with medication, but he's determined to make a last scientific breakthrough, and he feels to do this, he must go off his meds. Okay, so we open with, he's decided, eh, I don't really need these anymore. But he doesn't want the children to find out what he's doing, because they will flip. So he's doing this, and Abby and Ken have harboring some secrets of their own, and there's a new person on the periphery of the family 
family, Steph, and she doesn't make her connection known right away, but wait till the night of the party. I started reading this yesterday. It's one of those eminently readable books, like you're just sitting there going page, page, page. I've met all the characters now, and I can see it's going to be a wild ride, including that the father has decided not to go back on his meds, but to put together a different cocktail combination for when he sees the children so they don't guess what's going on. So really quite amusing. Next we've got um, Famous in a Small Town by Viola Shipman. And Viola Shipman's actually the pen name of an author named Wade Rouse. And he writes books in homage to his grandmother who had a really strong set of values in her. And that's the reason he um, writes under this name. So here we've got, uh, these books are set in Michigan. And Gary and Viola, well Viola is, okay let's go, Viola is Wade and he's married to Gary and they came to our house for dinner last week. And the book is set in, um, up in the upper coast of Michigan, or the lower coast, it's in Michigan. Lisa will correct me, I, I was saying the wrong coast of Michigan. So it takes place in Michigan and we're from New Jersey, that's all we need to know. So they, the book, it has a lot to do with cherries. So they come in, I have a bowl of cherries out, excellent hostess. Then I decide I'm going to make cherry brownies. I mean, I'm going to go over the top for these two authors that are coming for dinner. And cherry brownies are super easy to make. But I figure they need fresh cherries, so I buy those. They need dry cherries, I buy those. No, what they need is those cherries in the can that you put inside a pie. So this, yeah, so literally the brownies are a thing of brownie mix. You're hearing it here, folks. Brianna brownie mix, you, a full can of cherries, and, a, and a three quarters of a cup of oil, and you mix this together and you cook it. And he thought these were great, and I wanted to send him home with all of them, but he thought they were absolutely fantastic. So for most of this woman's um, first 80 years, Mary Jackson has endured, Mary Jackson has endured a steady invasion of tourists, tourists influencers and real estate developers who discovered the lakeside charm of Goodhart, Michigan, waiting patiently for the arrival of a stranger that she believes since childhood would one day carry on her legacy. Hold for this, folks. The very Cherry General store. Waiting for somebody to take over that legacy. Becky Thatcher came to Goodhart to forget she's just turned 40 with nothing to show for it. She was engaged and then not engaged, or maybe not engaged, she wasn't quite sure, but she finally decided, enough with this guy. Her parents are really upset, like, marry him already, marry him, you're 40. She says, no, I'm gonna go off, I'm gonna have a life for myself. So she ends up at the general store with Mary, is not the, base, ba the beach vacation she expected. But the feisty octogenarian talks to her about destiny, and the stronger Becky memories of her own childhood holidays become, and she gets visions about, gee, maybe this would be a really nice place to hang out. So she's under Mary's wing for the summer, and she starts believing that maybe this town is where her destiny could be. So famous in a small town. Now I am pairing this with Ann Patchett's new book, Tom Lake, because I want to show you how clever this presentation is. Now, there's a couple of things. First of all, Ann Patchett has decided that she wants her book to come out on August 1st. As many of you know, she's a bookseller. She has, owns Parnassus Books in um, Nashville, Tennessee. And she said August 1st is a great day for a book to come out because people have read a lot of the summer books already. There are a lot of people going on vacation the beginning of August. And this is what I want my on sale date to be. And she told the publisher, and think about that. You read a lot of books in June, you read a lot in July, and in August, you're waiting for something new. So here we've gotten this book. In the spring of 2020, Lara's three daughters returned to the family's orchard in northern Michigan. And while picking, fill in the blank here, cherries, they beg their mother to tell them the story of Peter Duke, a famous actor with whom she shared both a stage and romance years before at a theater company called Tom Lake. As Lara calls the past, her daughters examine their own lives and relationship with their mother, and they're forced to reconsider the world and everything they thought they knew. So we've got two books. We've got cherries. You've got tie-ins for your book groups. There you go. Now, I have to say that there are daisies on the cover of the book. I don't know why. There should be cherries, but no one asked me. Next, we've got The Favor, which is um, just on sale now. It's from Adele Griffin. Um, Adele and a couple other authors I'm going to talk about in this presentation were um, previously YA authors, and they've just started writing for adults. I don't know whether they hit a certain age and felt that they were now entitled to do this, if they felt their readers grew up or whatever, but we've got a number of authors that are now moving into this um, area. Adele was the two-time National um, Book Award finalist for two of her YA books. So you've got somebody coming in with um, some reading chops in front 
front of her. Um, at All Half Seconds, which is a high-end fairy tale vintage dress shop in Manhattan, Nora Hammond loves nothing better than pairing a rare find with the perfect client. The, I will tell you that the fashions in the store sound like unbelievable. The clothes, and you're going to get them for this great price, unlike there. At home, Nora grapples with the bleaker reality of enormous debt, a tiny apartment, and an ever-dwindling hope that she and her husband will ever have a family of their own. So she's put out a lot of money for IVF treatments, you know, all this along the way, which is something that Dale actually went through in her own life. So she has some understanding of this as she's writing this story. So this socialite, Eleven Elliot, charges into Nora's life, and they immediately have a connection in the store, mostly because, let's get real, Evelyn is buying a lot of things and um, Nora works on commission. So she literally goes home with so much money that first night her husband goes, do you think they're going to return the things? Do you think she's, no, I think this is the kind of woman who keeps the clothes. So she goes into New York society then. All of a sudden, uh, Evelyn wants to bring her every place and introduce her to everything. And she has to learn what it's like to be with the uber wealthy people. What is this all like? But it isn't until Evelyn decides that her next cause is to carry a baby for Nora that all the rules go out the window. And this really unlikely friendship begins to get tested. So there we've got the favor. No bigger favor than that. Next we've got The Wife App by Carolyn Mackler, another author who was a YA author and writes, used to write these really funny books. Um, my son, who's now 33, still remembers reading them and she had a real wicked sense of humor. So here she's got this book where Lauren, the mother of twins, stumbles on a dirty secret that explodes her marriage. When Madeline learns that she might lose her child to her ex in England, it stirs a, a decades-old personal tragedy. Sophie obsesses, obsesses about her ex-husband's family 2.0, the new wife, the new children, all while trying to keep her true desires hidden even from herself. So it all starts as a joke. They're out one night and the three of them said, why don't we start this thing called the Wife App? And this is what the Wife App is going to do. You're going to get paid for all the things you do for free, like packing lunches for the children, or you're going to go pick up the dry cleaning. And why should you not be compensated for all these things? They actually start to hire themselves out. You're not allowed to be hired out for sex. You're not allowed to ever like compromise somebody else's um, relationship. But this is what's going to end up happening. And they start to develop this app, it goes into the app store, and they start with just a couple of uh, zip codes in New York area, and then they start getting bigger and bigger, and then people come in and want to invest, but who are those people? Are they people they want to be with? Just a super fun book. I finished reading it yesterday. Not deep here, but a lot of fun about, you start to think about all these things that happen all day long, and the people, they're perfectly happy to um, hire you to fill out the camp forms, fill out those doctor's forms, and fill out all those things. I remember the month of September, all I did was fill out forms. So who knew? Take the car to get inspected. All these other things you never knew about. So it's a lot of fun just to see what people are hiring people to do and how much people rely on other people to do their dirty work. Next we've got The Better Half. This is by Ali Frank and Asha Humans. These two authors are a lot of fun. Now let me set up um, why I really like them. They both taught in a private preschool. They worked in a private preschool in the Seattle area. And one of them was in charge of admissions and the other one was the kindergarten teacher. And until you read their last book, which was called something. Well, Lisa's usually remembers these things that I don't. Their last book, their first book was Tiny Impressions. Second one was, oh, come to me. You have no idea what it's like to be actually picking the kindergarten class and what actually happens when you're picking what's going to happen. So what, what they would actually sit there and say to each other was, husband's really great looking. Where's that kid? We don't care. He's picking his nose. That's okay. Pick him anyway. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We want the good looking father in our class. We, we need these people. Oh, they look rich over there, oh, but they're obnoxious. Off the list. Which that child? That blonde over there? She's off the list. So they used to joke with each other. I just want you to know that someday we're going to write a book. So the two of them go on their merry way all these years and they're chatting about like when we write the book, when we write the book. Their lives go to different places, but one day Allie, who's white, calls 
Asha, who's black, as she's on the way back from her parents' home up in um, Sun Valley, Idaho, and she says, Asha, let's have a conversation about race. Now, this is like pre-2020. This is like, let's just talk about race and what it means. So these two people who could not be in many ways the same and in other ways more different from each other, both decide they're going to start writing these books. This is the third one. And I have it on my to read, read pile, and I'm just looking forward to it because they've got this real snappy way of going back and forth with each other. So here's what happens in this one. After a difficult five years, Nina Morgan Clark's time has finally arrived, with an ex-husband relocated across the country, her father bouncing back after the loss of his beloved wife, and a daughter, Zandra, thriving at boarding school, Nina is stepping into her dream job as the trifecta a first-generation black female head of the storied Royal Hawkins School. <coughs> Excuse me. To mark this moment, Nina and her best friend Marisol take a long overdue girls trip to celebrate the second half of their lives. This is where it's shaping up to, which to be the best half of her life. So as Nina's school year gets underway, all seems to be pressing as planned. But before long, her wonder hire, Jared Jones, relentlessly pushes Nina to her ethical limits. Soon after, dutiful Zandra accuses one of her teachers of misconduct. And most alarming, the repercussions of her trip with Marisol force her into a life-altering choice. So you know with these two, though, it's going to be funny. Never Meant to Meet You. Never Meant to Meet You was her last book. And they're, they're really just super fun books to read. Ne you just know Lisa Hickman, who works with me, is over there because I am the world's worst a title. Like, the reason the titles and authors are written down here is because I would be making them up if not because I'm really bad at remembering those. The staff told ch still chases me about the summer that there was some book that was by Chris Radish, and I had it was a story about white radishes someplace, and they're like, no, 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 Chris Radish is the author, Carol. So every week when the newsletter goes out on Friday nights, they double check me to see like who I've renamed because it's always fun. Next book is The Connollys of County Down by Tracy Lang. It's coming on August 1st, and she wrote a book last year that you may have remembered called We Are the Brennans. And so a lot of you who've read this book, this is the book, this is her second book. So when Tara Connolly is released from prison after saving 18 months on a drug charge, she knows rebuilding her life at 30 years old won't be easy. No money, no prospects. She returns home to live with her siblings, who are both busy with their own problems. Her brother, a single dad, struggles with the ongoing effects of a brain injury he sustained years ago, and her sister's fragile facade of calm and order is cracking under the burden of big secrets. Life becomes even more complicated when the cop who put her in prison keeps showing up unannounced, leaving Tara to wonder what he wants from her now. While she works to build a new career and hold her family together, she finds chance at love in the most unlikely place. But when the Connolly's secret starts to unravel and threaten their future, they all must face their worst fears and come clean or risk losing each other forever. So there we've got the Connolly's of County Down. I have this one on my pile at home. Big pile, folks. Okay, here we've got Banyan Moon, and this is by, okay, I, I've got this one right now, Tay Tai. That's how she pronounces her name, and I listened to her do an interview this morning to make sure I got that right, Tay Tai. Um, this book has actually just been announced as the Read with Jenna pick for July. Um, it was just announced the other day because why wait till July to announce anything? We might as well do it in June, okay? So this is, um, th this is that title. So when Anne Tran gets the call that her fiercely beloved grandmother, Min, has passed away, her life is already at a crossroads. In the years since she's last seen Min, uh, Anne has built a seemingly perfect life. But it all crumbles with one positive pregnancy test. Now she returns home to Florida to face her estranged mother, Huang. Huang is simultaneously mourning her mother and resenting her for having the relationship with Anne that she never did. Then Anne and Huang learn that Min has left them both the Mannion house, the crumbling old manor that was Anne's childhood home. Under the same roof, for the first time in years, mother and daughter must face the simmering questions of their past and their uncertain futures while trying to rebuild their relationship without the one person who's always seemed to hold them together. This book is also, um, HarperCollins always picks every quarter, something they call their lead read, which people have embraced internally at the company and they want to be um, all talking about and all sharing about. And this is the lead read for the second quarter of 2023. 
Next from Colson Whitehead. Many of you people read, remember the last book he wrote uh, where he, they were up in Harlem Shuffle. And this is picking up those same characters again because he had so much fun writing them. It's coming out in the middle of July. So first we've got 1971 and Ray Carney, remember him from the last book, tries to keep his head down. His days of moving stolen goods are over. It's strictly the straight and narrow from here on in. Until he needs, hold for this one, Jackson 5 tickets for his daughter. And he decides to hit up his old police contact Munson, fixer extraordinaire. Now I'm gonna pause for a second here. Remember anybody who grew up during the 70s, remember when the concert tickets used to go on sale at Ticketron? And you'd want it like, you had to know somebody at Ticketron to get the tickets at the beginning. I used to go to this drugstore in Journal Square where I was working for the summer, and I'd tell them ahead of time, I need four for the Rolling Stones. I'd still be up in the, the bleachers, up, in the, up on top. But you know exactly what you're talking about when you've gotta get the tickets for your kids. Okay, so he needs these tickets, but Munson has his own favors to request of Carnegie. You're not getting those tickets so easily. And staying out of the game gets a lot more complicated. Let's go to 1973. Pepper is Carney's endearing, violent partner in crime. It's getting harder to put together a viable crew. So Pepper takes on a side gig doing security in a shoot in Harlem. He finds himself in a freaky world of Hollywood stars, up and coming comedians, celebrity drug dealers, mobsters, and hitmen. Let's flip to 1976, and Carney's wife, Elizabeth, is campaigning for her childhood friend, the former assistant DA and rising politician, Alexander Oakes. When a fire severely injures one of Carney's tenants, he enlists Pepper to look into who may be behind it. And our crooked duo must battle way through the crumbling metropolis run by the shady, the violent, and the utterly corrupted. And that is what Colson Whitehead brings you, those people, crook manifesto. Next, we've got some fiction set at the beach because we are at the beach. It's time to read books at the beach. First is from the queen of summer reading is Ellen Hildebrand with The Five Star Weekend. Um, Ellen has announced that she's only gonna be writing one more book set in Nantucket and everyone who thought she was going away, no, 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 no. We hear she might be writing YA with her daughter going forward. So while this is an author that every, a lot of people have loved through the years, just know the stories may be continuing with a different drama happening up in Nantucket. So what we have here is Hollis Shaw's life seems picture perfect. She's the creator of the popular food blog, Hungry with Hollis. That's clever, Hungry with Hollis. And is married to Matthew, a, Matthew, a dreamy heart surgeon. Dreamy heart surgeon. Only beach reads will call him a dreamy heart surgeon, okay? But after she and Matthew get into a heated argument one snowy morning, he leaves for the airport and is killed in a car accident. The cracks on Hollis's perfect life, her strained marriage, and her complicated relationship with her daughter Caroline grow deeper. So when Hollis hears something called a five-star weekend, one woman organizes a trip for her best friend and from each phase of her life, her teenage years, her 20s, her 30s, and midlife, now, I just have to stop here for a second. It's, what, what are these, the, tw the teen years, 20s, 30s, and midlife? Like, where do we go to midlife? Like, how do we get there so quickly? I mean, midlife, I think, is much older than I am right now, and I will not tell you my age, but it's much older than now. But anyway, she decides to host her own five-star weekend, but the weekend doesn't turn out to be a joyful Hallmark movie. This book hits the Times list at number one, as you would expect, coming from um, Ellen, and start thinking about putting together your own five-star weekend. Next, we've got Emily Henry. I am including this book, Happy Place, because to date, I think this is the book that has sold the most hardcovers this year, 355,000 the last time I checked. The first week I doubt it was 95,000, which is an extraordinary number given like the, the, the current marketplace. So what do we have? We have a book that's a bit of a rom-com. In fact, it's a lot of a rom-com, but it completely works. Harriet and Wynne have been the perfect couple since they met in child in college. Except for now, for reasons that are not discussing, uh, they don't. They're not really the perfect couple. They broke up five months ago, and they still haven't told their best friends. So this is how they find themselves sharing a bedroom in the main cottage that has been their friends group getaway for the last decade. This is gonna be the last year they can get to the house, so everyone wants to be there. So they are lying through their teeth while trying not to notice how desperately they still wanna hang out with each other. After years of being loved, how hard can it be to fail it for one week in front of those who know you the best. Let's see what happens in Happy Place. 
Now we've got Beatrice Williams' book, which is coming out tomorrow. We've got a huge write-up on the New York Times this morning. Um, Beatrice is also an author that we credit with having the longest book descriptions. This is about one-third of what the book description is of this book. So I'm going to try and be brief, even more brief here than what's here. We started out in June 1946. As residents of Winthrop Island prepare for the first summer season after the war, um, a glamorous new figure moves into the guest cottage at Summerlee, the idyllic seaside estate of the wealthy Peabody family. Then you know you have the guest cottage, the people are wealthy, you know like something's not going to go right as soon as you hear those words all put together. So this is where Emily, um, Amelia Winthrop spent the war years caring for her incapacitated mother, Olive, and meanwhile, Olive like, had traveled the world. So as the summer rages on, Amelia develops a deep rapport with Olive. Um, Amelia discovers a deep rapport with Olive. But the Peabody patronage is a little bit flown apart by the arrival of Sumner Fox an FBI agent who demands Amelia's help to capture a Soviet agent who's transmitting vital intelligence on the West atomic program from somewhere inside the Summerlee estate. So there was where we have right after the war what's happening. So now eight years later, April 1954, Summerlee is boarded up and Amelia has rebuilt her shattered life as a professor at Wellesley College when shocking news arrives. The traitor she helped to convict is about to be swapped for an American spy imprisoned in the Soviet Union, but with mysterious condition only Amelia can fulfill. A reluctant Amelia is summoned to CIA headquarters this time where she's forced to confront the harrowing consequences of her actions on that fateful summer. So everything was not quiet at Summerlee, let's put it that way. Next we've got uh, Susan Wiggs and she's got Welcome to a Beach Town. And here in idyllic Alara Cove, a California beach town known for its sunny charm and its chill surfer vibe, it's graduation day at the elite Thornton Academy. At Thornton, students are worldly and overindulged children who live in gated enclaves with spectacular views. But the class valedictorian is Nikki Graziola, a surfer's daughter who is there on scholarship. To the shock of everyone in the audience, Nikki veers off script during her commencement address and reveals a secret that breaks open the whole community. Her accusation shakes the foundation of Alara Cove, pitting her against the ultra-wealthy family whose money runs the town. Her new notoriety sends Nikki in exile for years, where she finds fame, but not fortune, as overseas as a competitive surfer, until a personal tragedy compels her to return to Alara Cove. So there's Welcome to Beach Town. And staying in a beach theme, of, beach theme of mind, we've got My Magnolia Summer, which is by Victoria Benton Frank. And if you recognize Benton Frank, if you remember, her mother was Dortea Benton Frank, who wrote so many books that were set in the Low Country. So this is Victoria's first novel. She's written some, uh, some things for children. In New York City, winter never seems to loosen its hold. And for South Carolina transplant Maggie, the balmy beach weather of April back home on Sullivan's Island feels like a distant memory until a phone call from her sister Violet changes everything. Gran, the treasured matriarch, has fallen into a coma after a car accident caused by Maggie's troubled mother, Lily. But once Maggie returns, she finds that Sullivan's Island holds even more secrets. The Magic Lantern, the restaurant she owned and run by generations of women in her family, is now rudderless, and this, her sister seems headed for a savage breakup. When three generations of Sullivan's Island women join forces, the Pillar Grand, Troubled Lily, Impulsive Violet, and Redoubtable Maggie, anything is possible. So there's what happens on My Magnolia Summer. Next we've got California Golden, which is coming from Melanie Benjamin. You may remember her last book was A Children's Blizzard. I read that book, I was freezing. I wanted to put on a jacket because the, the poor children, they were out on the plains and it was based on a true story. And should you have sent the children home into the blizzard or kept them at the schoolhouse where there was no wood for a fire to keep them alive? 
those are big decisions to be made and we were having them made many book groups about what would you have done during this time while also freezing while reading this book because every single thing in this book was cold well she's redeeming herself here with California Golden so here in uh, Melanie's gut in Southern California in the 1960s in an era where women were expected to be housewives remember Mary Tyler Moore Carol Donnelly breaks the mold as a legendary female surfer struggling to compete in a male dominated sport and her daughters Mindy and Ginger Ginger <laughs> okay, okay. yeah yeah we remember um, the, the, the book the boat that never came back um, bear the weight of her unconventional lifestyle the Donnelly sisters grow up enduring their mother's absence both physically and emotionally to escape questions about her whereabouts and to chase her elusive affection they cut school to spend their days in the surf from her first time on the board Mindy's a natural and Ginger who would be me two years younger feels out of place in the water as they grow up their lives diverge Mindy and Ginger's relationship ebbs and flows but through it all the sense of duty to each other survives as they are forever connected by the emotional damage they carry from their unorthodox childhood now we've got some historical fiction and we're going to start out with one of my favorite books of the year, Lady Tan's Circle of Women, which is by Lisa C. If anybody has read Lisa through the years, how many people read uh, Snowflower and the Secret Fan? Okay. Great book, right? I think this one's even better, okay? And which, that, that's like big, big praise. Um, Lisa started out to write this book, and let me give you a quick backstory. It's um, 2020, and she's getting ready to write a book, and it's gonna send her deep into China. And she sees that's not gonna be happening, probably in 2021, 20, 22, probably not even this year, because she go do that. And she's really mourning herself. She's really thinking her writing life is over, which I will confess to you that I hear from a lot of authors every time they don't know what they're going to write next so Lisa turns around and she sees a book on her shelf a book that's been there for years and it's about you know um, women's medicine in the 15th century or 15 and she's like well wait, wait let me take a look at this book and she starts reading about this woman whose name is Tan and she says well you know I'm hearing about this reading about this woman named Tan and then she starts doing some more looking into it and this woman has actually written a book about medicine and she finds out that there's an English version of this book available and she has it within 24 hours and then she finds out that the woman who translated it lives about 15 minutes away from Lisa so these are COVID days they get online they start zooming with each other talking and Lisa starts going deep into research with all kinds of libraries where you can't go but professors have a lot of time to talk to you and they're more than happy to share what they know so let's go back to here's what happens in the book according to Confucius an educated woman is a worthless woman but Tan is being raised by her grandparents to be of use. Her grandmother is one, only one of a handful of female doctors in China, and she teaches her the pillars of Chinese medicine. From a young age, she learns about women's illnesses along a young, a young midwife in training, Mei Ling. And the two girls form a fast friendship and a mutual purpose. No mud, no lotus, they tell themselves. From adversity, beauty can bloom. So when Tan is sent into an arranged marriage, her mother-in-law forbids her from seeing Mei Ling and from helping any women in the household. She's taught to act like a proper wife, embroider bound foot slippers. Who, who remembers that from, like a snowflower? Like, who, who Googled that immediately when reading the book? What was that about? Whoa. Um, pluck instruments, recite poetry, give birth to sons. Remember, if you have a daughter, those nine months, whew, those are worth absolutely nothing. And stay forever within the walls of the family compound, the Garden of Fragrant Delights. And then something happens along the way. And it, 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 the book is really powered by there are different classes of people. And people who touch blood are midwives. And they are also the kinds of people who will do um, autopsies. But that is con considered not clean businesses. And doctors may not touch blood. And so as a result, when a woman is delivering a baby and all these things, they need to bring a woman in and they bring in these midwives. And what happens to Tan and what happens that she can bring to the women of the Garden of Fragrant Delights from there. It's an absolutely terrific book. I sailed through reading it really, really quickly because it was, it was, the pace on it was really, really terrific. And I also knew what bound feet looked like. Let's get real. So next we've got Nancy Horan's The House of Lincoln. 
Um, Nancy is the author of Loving Frank, which many of you may have read years ago, and Beneath a Starry Sky. Um, this new book was really brought to her as an idea that she wanted to work on because she grew up in Springfield, Illinois, and she was always captivated by Lincoln's, um, the, the legacy of Lincoln having lived there. And she really wanted to sit there and say, like, what did I know? What did I not know? What did I want to take away from this, you know, this time in um, history? So there's a woman in it, 14-year-old um, Anna Ferreira, who lands a job at the Lincoln household, assessing Mary, assisting Mary Lincoln with their boys and hostess duties borne by the wife of a rising political star. And what's really interesting is Anna Ferreira was actually, she's not a real person, she's based on um, a character from history. I was, did not realize that a lot of people from Madeira, uh, which is outside Portugal, came here to the United States and settled in that part of the country. And as a result, that is who this character is based on. So they were not slaves, they were free people, but by the same token, where, where, was, their, um, where was their position within the city like this? So she's supposed to be helping out the house, and she bears witness, witness to the evolution of Lincoln's views on equality and the union, and observes in full complexity the psyche and pain of this well, his wife, Mary, who's both really uh, terrific and polarizing at the same time, and extremely bold. So along with her African-American friend, Cal, Anna encounters the presence of the Underground Railroad in town and experiences personally how slavery is tearing apart her adopted country. And she's seeing like, you know, how they're hiding people and what they're doing to try to get people through the Underground Railroad. Um, culminating an eyewitness account of the little known Springfield race riot of 1908, the House of Lincoln takes readers on a journey through the historic changes that reshaped America and that continue to reverberate today. So you see how much progress we've made and how much we haven't as you're reading this book. Next up, we know there are lots of fans of Fiona Davis here in the audience, and we have a new book from her called The Spectacular that just came out last week. Um, this book is set, as you know, that um, Fiona sets her books in iconic New York City places, and this time it's Radio City Music Hall. So it's 1956 when 19-year-old Marion Brooks comes across an opportunity to, in, um, to audition for the Radio City Rockettes. And she jumps at the opportunity, instead of her predictable future, getting married and living in her small town and having children. And she wants to be this dazzling life of a performer. But the city is reeling with a string of bombings orchestrated by a person the press has renamed the Big Apple Bomber. With the public in an uproar, the police turn to Peter Griggs, a young doctor who espouses a radical new technique, psychological profiling. As both Marion and Peter find themselves unexpectedly pulled into a police search for the bomber, Marion realizes that if she hopes to uh, catch the culprit, she's going to have to stand out. Whereas, difference with the uh, Rockettes, everybody had to fit in. Everybody has to kick at the same time. So she's going to have to sacrifice everything she's worked for, as well as the people she loves the most. Next, from Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray, who last year or two years ago wrote The Personal Librarian, which I know a lot of people remember. Um, this is the First Ladies. The daughter of formerly enslaved parents, Mary McLeod Bethune, refuses to back down as white supremacists attempt to thwart her work. She marches on as an activist, an educator, and her reputation grows. She becomes a celebrity. Eleanor Roosevelt is eager to make Mary's acquaintance. Initially, they're drawn together because of their shared belief in women's rights and the power of education, and they become fast friends. When FDR is elected president, the two women begin to collaborate even more closely, and Eleanor becomes a controversial first lady for her outspokenness, particularly on civil rights. And when she receives threats because of her strong ties to Mary, it only fuels the women's desire to fight together for justice and equality. And this is like something that I did not know about um, Eleanor Roosevelt. So another side of her, another new story. Next, we've got The Wind Knows My Name, which is by Isabel Allende. Another story which is going to talk a lot about how things have changed and do still do remain the same. 
It's Vienna in 1938, and Samuel Adler is five years old when his family disappears during Kristallnacht. He, the, um, they lose absolutely, his father disappears, I'm sorry, during Kristallnacht, the night his family loses everything. As a child's safety becomes harder to guarantee, his mother secures a spot for him on a kinder transport train out of Nazi-occupied Austria to England. He boards the train alone, carrying nothing but a change of clothes and his violin. So let's go to Arizona in 2019. Eight decades later, Anita Diaz and her mother flee looming danger in El Salvador and seek refuge in the United States. But their arrival coincides with a new family separation policy, and seven-year-old Anita finds herself alone at a camp in Nogales. She escapes her tenuous reality through trips to Zanzibar, a magical world in her imagination. And meanwhile, Selena Duran, a young social worker, enlists the help of a successful lawyer in hoping of tracking down her mother. So the parallels of two different times, what has ended up happening. Um, if you Google Isabella Allende's name and outreach for those who are um, immigrants, she's got a whole charity that she's set up and what she's planning to, what she plans to do on that charity. I heard her interviewed about that, which is really interesting because when you think about Vienna 1938 now, like no matter where you stand on the issue, it's just an interesting parallel to be thinking about. Next, we've got The Invisible Hour, which is coming from Alice Hoffman. One bright, brilliant June day, when Mia Jacob can no longer see a world to survive, the power of words saves her. The Scarlet Letter was written almost 200 years, earl years earlier, but it seems to tell the story of Mia's mother. And Mother Ivy, and there's life inside the community, an oppressive cult in western Massachusetts where contact with the outside world is forbidden and books are considered evil. But how can Nathaniel Hawthorne have so perfectly captured the pain and loss that Mia now carries inside her? Through a journey of heartbreak, love, and time, Mia must abandon the rules she was raised with in the community. And as she does, she realizes that reading can transport you to other worlds with, uh, with, uh, or bring them to you. And that readers and writers affect one another in mysterious ways. She learns that time is more fluid than you can imagine and that love is much stronger than any chains that bind you. There's the invisible hour. Next, we've got Evergreen coming from Naomi Hirahara. Um, she wrote a book two years ago called Quark and Division. And I absolutely love this book because it talked about something that I did not know much about. We knew that during World War II, people who were Japanese that were living on the coast were put into camps. But what we didn't realize is that many people were then sent on to Chicago. And I did not know this. And they lived on the uh, crossroads of Clark and Division is where a lot of the people made their, their um, way and made their homes. So this is a continuation of the book Clark and Division, but it's not necessary to have read that book in order to be able to read this one. So it's been two years since Aki Ito and her family were released from the Manzavar Detention Center and resettled in Chicago with other Japanese Americans. And now the Itos have finally been allowed to return home to California. But the entire Japanese American community is starting from scratch, with thousands of people living in dismal refugee camps while they struggle to find new houses and jobs in overcrowded Los Angeles. Aki is working as a nurse's aide in a Japanese hospital in Boyle Heights when an elderly IC man is admitted with suspicious injuries. When she seeks out his son, she's shocked to learn that it's her husband's best friend, Bobby. Could Bobby be convicted of be, um, guilty of elder abuse? With only a few days later, little Tokyo is rocked by a murder at a low-income hotel where the wannabes stay. What secrets have they been hiding, and can Aki protect her husband from getting entangled in a murder investigation? So there we've got Evergreen, a Japantown mystery. Um, do a couple of books of World War II historical fiction. I guess you show of hands, who's still interested in World War II historical fiction, or is there waning? Okay, great. Um, I've just got a couple here, and they're books that are a little bit off the reservation, as I say, things you might not actually know about. The first is called The Postcard, and it's by Anne Barrest. Um, it, the time frame is, it's January 2003, and to get, together with the um, usual holiday cards, an anonymous postcard is delivered to the Brest family home. On the front is a photo of the Opera Garnier in Paris. 
On the back, the names of Anne Varest's maternal grand grandparents, Ephraim and Emma, and their children, Noemi and um, Jocks, all killed at Auschwitz. Fifteen years after the postcard is delivered, Anne, who's the heroine of this novel, is moved to discover who sent it and why. Aided by her chain-smoking mother, family members, friends, associates, private detectives, a graphologist, and many others, she embarks on a journey to discover the fate of the Rabinovich family, their flight from Russia following the revolution, their journey to Latvia, Palestine, and Paris. And what emerges is a moving saga that shatters long-held certainties about Anne's family, her country, and herself. So this is based on a story of her family. It's not exactly what happened, but it's based on it, and it's a novelization from there. Next, we've got Good Night Irene by Luis um, Alberto Guerrilla. This is based on a story from his mom, because his mom was one of the um, members of the uh, Donut Dollies during World War II. And she told him stories about what happened. So this is not her story, but it is a story about that time. In 1943, Irene Woodward abandons abusive fiance in New York to enlist with the Red Cross and head to Europe. She makes fast friends in training with Dorothy Dunford, a towering Midwesterner. And together, they're part of an elite group of women don't, nicknamed Donut Dollies who command military vehicles called clubmobiles at the front lines, providing camaraderie and a taste of home that may be the only solace before the troops head into battle. After D-Day, these two intrepid friends join the Allied soldiers streaming into France. Their time in Europe will see them entangled and embroiled in danger from the Battle of the Bulge to the liberation of Buchenwald. So there we've got Good Night Irene. Next from Kristen Harmel, we've got The Paris Daughter. Um, in Paris in 1939, young mothers Elise and Juliette become fast friends the day they meet in Paris. And though there's only a shadow of war creeping across Europe, neither woman suspects that their lives are going to be irrevocably changed. So Elise becomes a target of German occupation. She enlists Juliette with her most precious thing in her life, her young daughter, her playmate to Juliet's own little girl. But nowhere is safe in the war, not even the quiet little bookshop like Juliet's. Um, and when a bomb falls on their neighborhood, Juliet's world is destroyed along with it. So more than a year later, with the war already ending, Elise returns to reunite with her daughter, only to find her friend's bookstore has been reduced to rubble, and Juliet is nowhere to be found. What happened to her daughter on those last terrible moments, and Elise's desperate search leads her to New York and to Juliet one final fateful time. So I think these are all different. I'm, I'm trying to pick books that are a little bit different of talking about World War II instead of the usual stories that I think we've heard a lot about already. Now I've got some thrillers and mysteries. We're going to kick it off with Drowning, which is, comes, comes from T.J. Newman. Um, T.J. Newman's last book came out two years ago. It's called Falling. This is one of the first times I've seen a cover of two thrillers by the same author look pretty much the same. The last book was about um, a plane that people came on a plane and they were going to take, they, they, they were taking people hostage on the plane. This one is about a plane that's crossing into the Pacific Ocean. During the evacuation, this is six minutes after takeout, an engine explodes, the flood plane is flooded, and those who are alive are forced to close the doors, but it's too late. The plane sinks to the bottom with 12 passengers trapped inside. More than 200 feet below the surface, engineer Will Kent and his 11-year-old daughter Shannon are waist deep in water and fighting for their lives. Now, Will is taking his daughter to camp in, I believe it's Portland or Seattle, and his, or San Francisco, it's one of three. And his wife says, why do you have to take her? She can go on her own. You'll never put your child alone on the plane again after reading this book, because now she's very glad that her husband is with the child to help like, you know, solve this, this crime and uh, solve what's going on. So the only chance of survival is an elite rescue team on the surface led by professional driver Chris Kent. Chris is Shannon's mother and Will's soon to be ex-wife. So she's the one that's, their Navy's coming up with these ideas. Everybody's coming up with ideas. She's the one that's figuring this out. And they have to work together with Will to find a way to save their daughter and rescue the passengers from the sealed airplane, which is now teetering on the edge of an undersea cliff because we have to ramp it up enough. There's not much time. There's even less air. Okay. Now, T. 
TJ used to be a flight attendant, and she actually wrote the last book sitting in the jump seat on many, many, many a cross-country flight, taking notes on like watching the passengers, coming up with all kinds of ideas. So in this book, I said to her publisher, could her, her timing of something happening under the water be any more timely than what we've read over the last couple of days? To which I have, have to say that I have a friend who works for CNN, and she's really funny because she's always coming out with these really witty things to, to say, and she actually does um, a lot of the uh, arts entertainment uh, coverage on CNN. And the, yesterday, she's had probably one of her funniest lines. She is, I just am so impressed with all my friends that yesterday were um, experts on underwater marine implosion <laughs> that have now moved over to be experts on Russia and the other, the other armies that are coming in there. And she says, it's just amazing how my friends are so multiversal that they can write about anything online at any given time. So anyway, TJ, I, I brought her publisher the other day. I said, uh, does she have a fast track on this stuff or what's going on? So both Falling and Drowning are both being made into movies. This one does read like a, magazine, um, a movie script, but it's a lot of fun. Um, now we've got The Whispers by Ashley Adrain. I don't know if any of you read The Push last year. The Push, the little pink gloves. Remember the little pink mittens and that little child with the little pink mittens? Yeah, it terrified me. Never will we get little pink mittens the same way again. So what have we got here with The Whispers? On Harlow Street, the well-to-do neighborhood couples and children gather for a catered barbecue as the summer winds down, drinks continuing late into the night. Everything is fabulous until the picture-perfect hostess explodes in a fury because her son disobeys her. Everyone at the party hears her exquisite veneer crack, loud and clear, and before long, the same boy falls from his bedside window in the middle of the night. And then his mother can only sit by his hospital bed where she refuses to speak to anyone and his life hangs in the balance. What happened next over the course of three tense days as each of these women grappled with what happened and led to that terrible night? So there you go, the whispers. Those little pink gloves, those who read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Woo, scary. Next we've got Ruth Ware, Zero Days. Ruth Ware usually lock, writes locked room mysteries, as many of you know. You've read her through the years. The It Girl, The Woman in Cabin 10. Well, got a little bit of a different story here. Hired by companies to break into buildings and hack security systems, Jack and her husband Gabe are the best penetration specialists in the building. But after a routine assignment goes horribly wrong, Jack arrives home to find her husband dead. To her horror, the police are closing in on their suspect, her, Jack. Suddenly on the run and quickly running out of options, she must decide who she can trust as she circles closer and closer to the real killer. Ruth Ware is this really like sweet woman, really, she looks like an English grandmother that writes really, really, really scary books. So there you go, Ruth Ware. The Only One Left by Riley Sager. He, last year's book was The House Across the Lake. The Hope family murder shocked the Maine coast one bloody night in 1929. When most people assume 17-year-old Lenora was responsible, the police were never able to prove it. Lenora's never spoken publicly about that night, nor has she set foot outside Hope's End, the cliffside manor where the massacre occurred. Now, I have to just stop here for a second. She never steps foot out. Do people bring her food? This is before, you know, a grub hub. Like, this is before you can get any of these things delivered. I want to know how this woman is existing. I, I assume there's a lot of help. <coughs> Excuse me. So now it's 1983, and home health aide Kit McDear arrives at the decaying Hope's End to care for Lenora. Confined to a wheelchair, Lenora was rendered mute by a series of strokes and can only communicate with Kit by tapping out sentences on an old typewriter. One night, Lenora used it to make a tantalizing offer. I want to tell you everything. As Kit helps Lenora write about the events leading to the Hope family massacre, it becomes clear that there's more to the tale than people know. So there's the only one left, and that is poor Lenora. Next, we've got The Block Party by Jamie Day. This will have you thinking about your neighbors. The residents of the exclusive cul-de-sac on Elton Road are entangled in a web of secrets and scandal utterly unknown to the outside world and even to each other. On the night of the annual summer block party, there has been a murder. Who did it and why takes readers back one year earlier as rivalries and betrayals unfold, discovering the real danger lies within their own block. Nothing and no one is ever as it seems. 
just has me thinking about my neighborhood. The woman across the street doesn't come out a lot. I know that Tuesdays and Fridays, okay, that's garbage delivery, pickup day, they pull in her driveway. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, her um, generator goes on, two o'clock in the afternoon, you can set your watch by it, literally. So you have all these things that happen. You realize when you look around your neighborhood, what do you know and what you don't know about the people? Oh, the people down the street, they're walking a dog and it's not as good, well-behaved as their last dog. But what do you really know? know about all of these people that you think you know so well. Have a block party. Okay. Next we've got Hello Stranger by Catherine Center. Sadie Montgomery never saw what was coming, literally. One minute she's celebrating the biggest achievement of her life, placing as a finalist in the North American Portrait Society competition. The next she's lying in a hospital bed diagnosed with face blindness. She can see, but every face she looks at now looks like a puzzle of disconnected features. But as she struggles to cope, hang on to her artistic dream, work through major family issues, and take care of her beloved dog, Peanut, she falls in love. Not with one man, but two. Making judgment calls on anything right now is a nightmare. If only her life were a little bit more in focus, Sadie might be able to have it all. I just know that whoever wrote that copy sitting there going, oh, wasn't that really funny? Life in focus, ha <laughs> ha disconnected features. Okay, Sherry LaPena writes a book about every two years, and she's known for the book, The Couple Next Door, and this is her next book, Everyone Here is Lying. It's coming out the end of the month, and this is what I call Sherry, she's my one sit read, which means once I sit down and start reading that book, I don't move until it's done, because she writes those chapters that at the end go, and then, and then, and then, and you just can't stop reading her. So here we've got William Wooler is a family man on the surface, but he's been having an affair, an affair that ended horribly this afternoon at a motel up the road. So he returns to his house, devastated and angry. He finds his, his difficult nine-year-old daughter Avery unexpectedly home from school. He loses his temper. Hours later, Avery's family declares her missing. Suddenly the neighborhood doesn't feel so safe, and William isn't the only one on the street who's hiding a lie. As witnesses come forward with information that may or may not be true, Avery's neighbors become increasingly unhinged. Who took Avery Wooler? There you go, Sherry, you're gonna keep me reading, I can see it coming. Next we've got Laura Lippman's Prom Mom. Amber Glass has spent her entire adult life putting as much distance as possible between her and her hometown of Buffalo, of uh, Baltimore, I'm sorry, where she fears she will be forever known as prom mom. The girl who allegedly killed her baby on the night of her prom after her date, Joe Simpson abandoned her to pursue the girl he really liked. But when circumstances bring Amber back to the city, she realizes she can have a second chance as long as she stays away from Joe, who's now married. The problem is Amber can't stay away from Joe and Joe finds it's increasingly hard for him to ignore Amber. Against a surreal backdrop of 2020, which was surreal, but we can always say surreal 2020, and 2021, the two are slowly drawn to each other and eventually cross the line they've been trying not to cross. And then Joe asks Amber to help him do the unthinkable. There we've got prom mom. Now Sarah Pekinen, is, um, she often writes with um, another author whose name I am spacing, um, Sarah Pekinen and Greer Hendricks, okay? So now they're each writing on their own. Sarah Pekin's book is called um, It Gone Tonight. She's the co-author of The Wife Between Us. So any of you remember that book? That's the, book, this is the author we're talking about. Catherine Sterling thinks she knows her mother. Ruth Sterling is quiet, hardworking, and lives for her daughter. All her life, it's been just the two of them against the world. But now Catherine's ready to spread her wings, move from home, and begin a new career. And Ruth will do anything to prevent that from happening. Ruth thinks she knows her daughter. Catherine would never rebel, never question anything about her mother's past or background. But when Ruth's desperate quest to keep her daughter by her side begins to reveal cracks in Ruth's carefully constructed world, both mother and daughter begin a dance of deception. And Sandra Brown, who is my float in the um, pool in August read every year, has written Out of Nowhere. 
At a Texas County Fair, children's book author Elle Portman is enjoying, enjoying a rare night out with her two-year-old son, Charlie. Just as about to lay, lay, head home, a shooter opens fire into the crowd. Also caught in the melee is corporate consultant Calder Hudson. He's frustrated and confused when he wakes up in the hospital after undergoing emergency surgery on his arm. The doctor tells him he was lucky that all so far as the gunshot wounds go, he pulled through remarkably well. Others weren't so lucky, which instills in Calder a fierce determination to get justice, a goal that is shared by Elle. Their chance encounter at the police station leads to a, subscribe, a surprising and inexplicable gravitation to one another. But even as the attraction grows, they can't help but wonder if the unimaginable tragedy that brought them together is too painful and too complicated to sustain, especially while the shooter remains at large. Now it's interesting, we've had a number, sadly, of shootings across this country. And we're seeing now this starting to be reflected in fiction. And some people are saying, well, I know one author was recently asked to take it out of his book and to change it to be something else. And it comes that moment of, are we reflecting the times? Are we sharing what's going on? Are we um, taking something that shouldn't be regarded as wonderful and making it part of fiction? Does it belong there? There's a lot to think about here because it is also real life at this point. And it's interesting because one of the best books I read was 19 Minutes by Jody Pico years ago about that what happened in that 19 minutes in that school. And anybody who's read it, remembers it, it stays very, very much with you, especially when you find out what's really happened that day. So it's interesting to see Sandra taking this on. She's an author of, you know, been around long enough that I think she can be the one that says, I'm going to write this book. Next we've got Lisa Jules, and none of this is true. Celebrating her 45th birthday at her local pub, popular podcaster Alex Summer crossed his paths with an unassuming woman named Josie Fair. Josie, it turns out, is also celebrating her 45th birthday. A few days later, Alex and Josie bump into each other again, this time outside Alex's children's school. Josie's been listening to Alex's podcast, and she thinks she might be an interesting subject for her series. Josie's life appears to be strange and complicated, and although Alex finds her unsettling, she can't quite resist the temptation to keep making the podcast. So slowly she starts to realize that Josie's been hiding some very dark secrets. Before she knows it, Josie then vagled her wife, life, her way into jo Alex's life and into her home. But as quickly as she arrives, Josie disappears. Only then does Alex realize that her life and her family's lives are under mortal threat. Who's Josie Fair and what has she done? And I've got to ask Lisa, Lisa's always got this kernel of an idea that has her start writing a book. Like one day she was picking up her kids at school and there was a guy there that just didn't quite fit in. And she decided that that guy was like a terrorist and all this kind of stuff and it's where she took the story from there. So there's always this little kernel of a thing that just makes her say, okay, I've got to start writing now and this is what I'm going to do. Next from Jennifer Weiner, we've got The Breakaway. Something about this book, usually Jennifer is on sale in May, usually mid-May, and this is the first time she's on sale in August. And something else is, um, any of you who follow her on social media, she loves to bike ride. Like she's the type of get up in the morning, oh, let's see, let me get up, it's, um, I'm Philadelphia, let me ride to Baltimore today. Let me then ride on to Washington, D.C. I mean, my idea of riding is maybe the recumbent buck in my room, maybe if I can get all the stuff off of it. So here we've got 34-year-old Abby Stern has made it to a happy place. She's at peace with her plus-size body, at least most of the time, and she's on track to marry her childhood sweetheart, Mark. Yet Abby can't escape the feeling that something isn't right, or the memories of one mind-blowing night spent with a man named Sebastian two years ago. So when Abby gets a last-minute call to lead a bike group from New York City to Niagara Falls, I'll drive, folks. Um, she's happy to have time away from Mark and a chance to make up her mind. Mark or Sebastian, Mark or Sebastian. But on the first day, Abby is shocked to see Sebastian in the tour group. That'd be interesting. To make things even worse, there's a last minute addition to the trip, Abby's mother. Eileen, whom Abby blames for her lifetime of insecurities that she's still trying to undo. 
you're a mother, you are always blamed for the lifetime of insecurities that the children are trying to undo. This is not a very a unique plot line. So over the next two weeks, strangers become confidants, hidden truths come to light, and a teenage girl with a secret will unite all the writers in surprising ways. All while um, Abby's all uncertainties about herself, her mother, and the nature of love are challenged. I've got the breakaway. Karen Slaughter's After That Night. If any of you watch Will Trent on ABC, this is one of her Will Trent novels. 15 years ago, Sarah Linton's life changed forever when a celebratory night out ended in a violent attack that tore her world apart. And since then, she's remade her life. A successful doctor engaged to a man she loves, she's managed to leave the past behind her. Until one evening on a call to the ER, everything changes. She battles to save a broken young woman who's been brutally attacked. But as the investigation progresses, led by GBI Special Agent Will Trent, it becomes clear that Danny Cooper's assault is uncannily linked to Sarah's, and the past isn't going to stay buried forever. So we've got two biographies and mom fiction. There's not a lot that comes out this time of year. If anybody's looking for um, a good um, nonfiction book that came out earlier this year, The Wager is one that you may want to take a look at that is based on something that um, happened uh, off the coast of, I want to say it's Australia, years ago. So that's another one to take a look at. Um, first, we've got Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City by Jane Wong. It's the 1980s on the, 19, on the Jersey Shore. Jane Wong watches her mother shake ants from the M MSG bin behind the family's Chinese restaurant. She's a hungry daughter frying crab ragoon for lunch, a child seeking naps on bags of rice, a playful sister scheming to trap her brother in the freezer before he traps her first. She is part of a family staking their claim to the American dream, even as the dream crumbles. She's beneath Atlantic City's promise lies her father's gambling addiction, which causes him to disappear for days and leads to the loss of their restaurant. In her debut memoir, Wong tells a story about a new story about Atlantic City and making do with what you have and what you don't, what it means to be both tender and angry, and what is strength without vulnerability and humor. So there's Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. And next we've got Never Give Up by Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw is my favorite news anchor of all time. The night that he left NBC Nightly News, I confess to driving down the street, watching on the jumbo trine, pulling over and crying, okay? Like this is how much I think he was, you know, it, it, there are very few broadcasters that you don't know much about their politics. You don't know much about them at all. You just know I'm delivering the news and I'm delivering it in the best way possible. And I just felt like that he was like that kind of guy. And he wrote The Greatest Generation. He's written a book about his uh, family helping him cope with his um, multiple myeloma, which he's now 10 years out from being first diagnosed with. I understand it was on CBS um, Sunday morning yesterday. I didn't catch it, but I'll have to you know catch that two days ago. Um, so what do we have? in this book. Tom Brokaw's father read left school in the second grade to work at the family hotel, the Brokaw House, established in Bristol, South Dakota by R.P. Brokaw in 1883. And if you, any of you watching 1883 on Paramount, like you know exactly what those times were like in this part of the country. Eventually, through work on construction jobs, Red developed an exceptional talent for machines. Tom's mother, Jean, was the daughter of a farmer who lost everything during the Great Depression. Although they don't, they don't have much money in their marriage, Red's philosophy of never give up served them well. His big break came after World War II, when he went to work for the Army Corps of Engineers, building the great dams across the Missouri River. Late in life, Red surprised his family by recording his memoirs of the hard times of his early life, reflections that inspired this book. So think about what a gift that was for him to have given the family to explaining about what these times were and how much you wish you could pass along stories like that or hear stories from your own family of what those times meant. So this is what I'm really looking forward to seeing, reading rather. 
Um, here are some notable June paperback releases. Um, Carrie Soto is back, Taylor Jenkins Reid, the book that taught Carol Fitzgerald everything she knows about tennis, because before this she knew nothing, okay? So by reading this book, I actually was able to watch the US Open last year and understand what a lot was going on, because before I could not speak to our editorial director except to say, I think it's on tonight and I think you want to watch because it's one of his favorite things is tennis. Lisa Jewell, The Family Remains, The Lake Cumber from Jean Hamp Korowitz, Nelson DeMille's The Maze. Nelson's got a new book coming in October, folks, for those. Um, it's another one he wrote with his son about the same investigative team that came out in a couple, a couple years ago in a book. Um, Tom Parada's Tracy Fick, Flick Can't Win. It's based in New Jersey, folks, and it's very funny. Um, and Louise Penny's A World of Curiosities. I, can I now not go for, okay, wait, until I'm going forward too much. Um, each year, I pick bets on selections, books that I'm betting that people will love. I've made, um, actually, we, there are two more to add here. I've made 19 um, bets on selections so far this year. I have to say that this is my slowest year of picking bets on selections, and one of the reasons is, I think that some books are good this year, but they're not fantastic, and as a result, I've been holding back on some of the things that I've been picking. Um, three that were really super noteworthy here or Go is a River by Shelley Reed, um, William Landy's All That Is Mine I Carry With Me, and Kate Morton's Homecoming. So all three I found were really, really terrific. Um, Kate Morton's Homecoming is a book within a book. There is a true crime novel written within the book, so it's really interesting to see what she pulled off there. Um, also, we do Book Reporter Talks to Video and Podcasts. Recently, I've interviewed Lisa C., Nancy Haran, Linwood Barkley, and Alice Elliott Dark. And thank you all for your kind attention, and here's to a great summer of reading. Excuse me, what? His father story. Father story. Isn't that wild? I know, crazy, right? Oh, I'm going to do the gift. I'm going to do these. Oh, thank you.